Hi, good afternoon if you're on the East Coast, and good morning if you're out West. Uh, my name is Aaron Lacey, and you are listening to uh, the latest installment of Thompson Coburn's Higher Education Webinar Series. We are a law firm uh, based in uh, the Midwest, but with offices all over the place, like Chicago and L.A. and D.C., uh, and we have a higher education practice. And some of you know, because you listen regularly, one of the things that uh, our practice does is offer um, an annual webinar series focused on issues in and around higher education. And this is actually the second one we're offering up this year uh, that deals with mergers and acquisitions in higher ed. And uh, I'm very pleased uh, to uh, introduce to you in a couple of minutes two of my partners uh, who are doing a lot of work in this space along with me uh, and I'm the host of the webinar series uh, and lead the practice before we get started though and start uh, getting into a little more detail I do want to offer some housekeeping um, items up for you all in your consideration so first of all if you have questions during the webcast uh, you can submit them through the little Q and a widget at the bottom of your screen and our platform has lots of wonderful widgets that you can explore during the presentation we'll try to answer these questions uh, at the end so we're going to get all of those um, and collect them and we'll try to go through them in the final minutes a copy of the slide deck uh, is available in the resource widget so if you want the slides you can get them right now and you can download them uh, and we encourage you to do so you can also find uh, additional answers to some common technical issues so if you're having a problem with your browser or something along those lines um, in uh, the help widget at the bottom of the screen this webinar like all of our webinars that are part of this series is CLE accredited that's continuing legal education so if you are an attorney and you are looking to get CLE, you may have the opportunity to do so today. Uh, this webinar is accredited for CLE in Missouri uh, and Illinois and California. And if you want credit in another state, uh, then you can reach out to them and see if they will accept it. We award CLA, CLE based on attendance uh, for the entire 60 minutes. So from time to time, you will be required to click a little pop-up screen uh, just to reflect your continued engagement. That way, we know that you are are still here. Um, we value your opinions and we appreciate your participation. There is a survey element that you can fill out and we really encourage and, uh, and hope that folks will take some time to do that. It's really fast. We try to make every webinar better than the one before and we take seriously your feedback and try to incorporate it uh, when we're thinking about how to do that. I mentioned this is part of the Higher Ed webinar series. If you look on your screen, you will see uh, the topics that we're covering this year. Um, the sessions that we've already offered up in August and September uh, are available on our website, free and on demand. We have, a, and I'll show you that slide at the very end of the presentation. So if you miss those and you'd like to go back and uh, check into them, that's including one uh, talking about some other parts of higher ed uh, mergers and acquisitions, and specifically the Department of Ed's process. And then we had a really nice one in September on cybersecurity, which is, um, as a lot of you know, sort of an increasing uh, concern for a lot of institutions. So you can go back and listen to those even if you miss them. And then I uh, hope you'll join us in the months to come. I'll be talking about some new rules from the department in November. We'll take a break in December, and then we've got a whole slate of content for you for the spring semester. Um, who's going to be doing most of the presenting today, and I may jump in a little bit because I do some of this work, but the real leaders of the presentation. Uh, the first is my partner, uh, Emily Murphy, uh, out of our D.C. office, who is uh, one of our merger and acquisition gurus, especially in the higher ed space, and we work together a lot. Um, has, uh, Emily has represented uh, on a number of transactions with both um, proprietary institutions and nonprofit institutions uh, uh, in various merger and acquisition acquisition type scenarios and of course we'll be talking about all of that today and has been working with schools since 2003 and we've been working together for a long time actually. Uh, I think we understand uh, that when you are in the higher education space and you are an institution or potentially an investor involved with an institution, you know higher ed special and there are particular considerations around it. Um, part of that's a regulatory environment, and part of it is just the unique nature of institutions of higher education. And one of the things I certainly value uh, about Emily is that she appreciates what is unique about the space and takes that into consideration when dealing with mergers and acquisitions. Also, uh, very pleased to introduce our partner, Sean Crowley, out of our Chicago office. Uh, and uh, Sean is one of our tax guys. And if you are going to uh, um, contemplate 
complete or move forward with the transaction, uh, particularly at the institution level, tax considerations are very important. Uh, and so uh, Sean has worked with us similarly on a number of higher education projects. And uh, Sean and Emily, I'm just so grateful for both of you being here today and taking your time uh, to talk through sort of the corporate and tax considerations that really come into play in these negotiations. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Emily. Thank you so much, Aaron. That was a great introduction, and it's great to be here today. Um, for those of you who have joined us in the past, welcome back. And for um, the new ones, uh, we're delighted that you've joined us today. Um, before us, you'll see the agenda. Um, we are going to take a few minutes to take a look at the current landscape of the higher education space see what's been happening. Uh, we've been seeing um, quite an increase in transactions. We'll talk a little bit about why that's happening, um, some benefits and maybe some cons um, as you consider a potential transaction for your institution. Um, then I'll take a couple of minutes to go over some common structures for, for merging these institutions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that word merger, um, which is a legal concept but used widely in higher ed. Um, when two institutions join forces, and there's just a number of ways that we can do that. Um, section three, we'll talk, um, you know, sort of the meat of today's presentation, which is things to consider from a corporate and tax perspective as you're structuring your transaction. Um, you know, like I said, we, we refer to these as sort of anecdotal mergers, but actually mergers are not legally what happens a lot of times in this space and we'll see more um, asset or stock deals um, happening. And then, you know, section four will give you some quick takeaways of things that you want to consider um, as you're thinking about your institution and its future vision. And then in section five, Aaron will talk a little bit more about the resources that are available to you from our firm um, for higher education institutions. And then section six, uh, we will have a little bit of time for Q&A. So I encourage you as we go through the presentation to submit your questions via the Q&A button, which I think is at the bottom of the screen. And we will go through as many as we can at the end of the presentation. And to the extent that we don't get to your question, we'll certainly follow up um, via email. All right, so the very first section here, part one, um, snapshot of the current landscape. So what are we seeing right now? We, we do have some institutions that are doing quite well. Um, we do have some that are in some distress. Um, I would say that overall in the industry, we're seeing decreased enrollments across all the whole board. Um, so presidents and owners are struggling with how do we get those numbers up? Because you know, one theme we'll touch upon a few times today is that there is strength in numbers. And so to the extent that we can get those enrollments up, schools are um, in a better position to weather downturns or bad times. Um, we have seen a return of investors interested in the higher education space. So that's domestic as well as some international interest as well. Um, the current administration is a more favorable regulatory environment for transactions and the, you know, for higher ed generally than the, you know, very hostile Obama administration. Um, of course, we have to keep in mind that, you know, we're in an election cycle right now. And so we do actually see a lot of institutions taking advantage of this um, favorable regulatory environment because there's some uncertainty in 2020. If there were to be a change in administration, um, it, it's unclear whether we could get the, we could see the reins tighten back up or if we can continue to enjoy a little bit more breathing room as we have in the past few years. Um, but you'll see, you know, the challenges for institutions right now are right there in front of you. Um, everyone is seeing decreased enrollments. Um, just the demographics of this country point to fewer 18-year-old high school graduates, um, less international students who typically pay full freight are coming to the United States um, to enroll. And so those are struggles that all institutions are facing um, from time to time and especially right now. So what we've seen is that higher education mergers are expected to increase. Um, and there's a lot of benefits that can come from that. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about synergies, whether it's you know, back office, you know, trimming down expenses, 
um, or combining those student forces to get those more robust enrollment numbers um, that bring in that tuition and revenue that's really critical to every institution. So Aaron, do you want to provide some thoughts on what you're seeing in the marketplace right now? Uh, yeah, happy to do so. Um, and I, you know, Emily has already touched on a lot of this, so I won't uh, spend too much time. But I agree. You know, we work a lot. I mean, my whole practice is fo focused on higher ed, right? And um, you know, what I'm seeing is, to Emily's point, there are an increased number of institutions for a wide range of reasons that may be uh, experiencing some level of financial distress. And that's really in all sectors uh, of higher education. Um, there is some recent data that has shown that there's actually overall sort of a reduction in the number of institutions of higher ed. Uh, and, and to Emily's point, I think what you're what higher education right now is experiencing a period of contraction and consolidation, right? And and when you consolidate or contract, uh, a lot of times that is accomplished through um, some form of uh, transaction, whether that be a merger or an acquisition or, or some other structure. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, I, w while on the one hand there are institutions that are distressed, there are still hundreds, thousands of institutions that are doing very well and, and have access to capital, have interested investors, Investors and to Emily's point, um, see value in potentially going through some sort of transaction with another institution, whether that's to add uh, students by virtue of the transaction or to acquire valuable programming or locations or, or brand and legacy. Um, because a lot of these schools that may be experiencing a decline in enrollment still have a, a great deal to offer. I mean, they have wonderful faculty, they have good programming, uh, they have intellectual property in the way of brands and uh, uh, legacy value that's of great interest, alumni support, et cetera. Um, so for an institution that has the wherewithal, um, combining or or uh, merging that other institution into theirs and bringing them under their umbrella can be a very, uh, it can have hold the potential for a very positive outcome. So I think you're seeing schools um, that may be experiencing some distress, but at the same time are uh, have a lot to offer. And uh, on the other side, schools that um, have some capital and are, are poised to grow or innovate and see that type of combination as being uh, one that could have great value. The other thing we've highlighted on the slide here that we also are seeing is um, our examples of, of institutions that uh, not only have value but may have a particular type of value. And, and I think where this really you're seeing right now in the space is around uh, schools that have uh, – developed and and successful online platforms, uh, whether it be a for-profit institution or a non-profit institution, but, you know, someone who's been in the space for a number of years and has the experience and the wherewithal, uh, but for whatever reason is no longer uh, believes that, the, that their long-term plan involves being uh, out on their own. So you see a situation, and, and I think Purdue Kaplan is a great example of this, that certainly is not the only one, uh, where in that case a large public institution with a lot of resources and strong uh, management and vision uh, saw uh, another entity, in this case very different kind of institution, right, uh, in, in Kaplan, a proprietary institution, very focused on online, a lot of working adults, very career focused, uh, but nonetheless that had this developed and desirable platform. And, and Purdue said, you know, we think we could take that rather than trying to create something from scratch and, uh, and achieve a very positive outcome. And, and that transaction got a lot of press. And I think is a wonderful example and potentially quite emblematic of the types of combinations that uh, we're going to see going forward. So all of this is just to echo what Emily had to say. Um, it, right now, the higher education as an industry, to the extent you want to think of it that way, is certainly going through a period of change. And uh, as part of weathering that change and as part of sort of evolving, I think you're going to see uh, whether it's on the proprietary side or nonprofit side or across uh, uh, sectors, I think you're going to see uh, a lot of interesting transactions. And Emily, I know we were talking about there was an article in the New York Times just yesterday uh, that really got into this uh, very topic and talked a lot about the increase in uh, transactional activity that is that is happening in the space. Yeah, so that's that a great article. Yeah, I'll toss it back. <laughs> 
Thank you. No, that was a great article, and maybe we can add that um, to our deck so that everyone can take a look at that. I thought it was really quite timely and spoke to so many of the issues and matters that we'll talk about today. Um, so thank you, Erin. That was great. Um, always good to know, you know, take the temperature of the space um, for someone who spends 100% of their time professionally there. Um, so on this slide, I wanted to just talk a little bit about, you know, if, if you might be thinking about a strategic transaction, you want to think about some of the pros and some of the cons, right? So with every decision um, for your institution, you've got to keep all of these things in mind, and it's a balancing act. Um, so some of the benefits of a transaction are right there in front of you. Um, just as Aaron said, it, it's a faster than organic growth, you know, trying to start from scratch and build an online program or, you know, you could just immediately purchase um, an online program or a graduate division um, that might, uh, you know, not only bring more programs to your students, but, you know, get those enrollment numbers up to where you want them to be. Um, there's, of course, efficiencies when you reduce back office and, you know, maybe one of the partners is terrific at financial aid or compliance and so you've got just a built-in support system there um, and you don't need to duplicate efforts. Um, you know, with the enrollments comes better finances and your balance sheet looks better. Um, maybe real estate is involved or you're, you know, improving your geographic footprint um, to be more interesting to more students. Um, I, you know, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the second half of the slide, which is that, you know, there is this stigma in higher ed to talk about mergers and acquisitions because it sounds like a, you know, kind of like a for-profit word, but it's, it, it really can be a strategic move and it can preserve your institution. It can further your mission so that you can increase your impact. It can really improve the future and serve the students that all of you are doing today. Um, so I want to, I want everyone to start thinking about higher ed M&A not as a bad word, but more as, um, you know, a strategic move or something that could, um, you know, preserve your institution for a longer time. Um, sometimes we see that because of this reluctance, you know, owners, presidents, boards might wait a little bit too long. Um, they really want to try all efforts and, you know, make it on their own, and so they see it as a last resort. And so we really don't recommend that. Uh, you know, your leverage will decrease if you are getting too far down in terms of numbers and you become less um, valuable as a partner for another entity, and worse, you could face closure if your transaction is unsuccessful or if there isn't enough time um, to get it done. So as we'll talk about a little bit later, you know, it does take some time, it does take some upfront expenses, and as you go down, further down the rope, you may be running out of both of those things. Um, a few other things that, you know, weigh on boards and, you know, presidents' minds are, you know, the loss of control or the loss of some jobs as you, you know, streamline your, your organizations. I mean, it, it, it can be tough, and M&A is not you know, a happy ending for all, but, you know, if you've preserved the institution to continue the mission, I do think that's a, a generally a positive outcome. So, you know, as uncomfortable as it might be, you know, conversations about M&A, and typically these often happen, whether it's through a broker or just two presidents, you know, meeting for coffee, um, these, that's how these conversations kind of take place. Um, that would be a far better solution than facing closing or, uh, by, you know, closure of a school or, you know, a teach-out situation. Okay, so here I'm going to talk about um, some of the common structures that we see in the space and just from, you know, I'm the corporate attorney, so I will help you, you know, put together what makes sense for your institution in terms of what you want to accomplish as your business goal. Um, but I do want to generally make the comment that, you know, M&A is a process. And sometimes it doesn't end in a closing or a transaction, and that might be okay. The diligence process, just going through this, can sometimes lead you to determine the best future for your school. And so that might be a merger, it might be a partnership, but it might not. Um, but it is important to go through the exercise um, if you're faced with an uphill battle or, you know, if, if a a partnership might make sense. Um, it's worth exploring 
um, just to see, you know, to make sure you decide what's best for your school. Okay, so here on this slide, um, you know, people talk about M&A, mergers and acquisitions, um, you know, very informally. It, you know, in higher ed, everyone calls these types of strategic transactions mergers. Um, and that's a legal concept where two entities kind of jointly, you know, merge together and become this joint venture type entity. And actually, we don't, you know, it's on the third on the list there, but it's actually less common in the higher ed space. And I'll dig deeper in part three about what we typically see, and that's mostly equity and asset. Um, auction is another option. That's where you either engage a broker or another third party to solicit proposals for your institution. And then you um, would you know, provide a limited amount of diligence um, to interested parties. And then you could take a look at a number of competitive bids um, to see if any of those would be attractive to you um, as a potential partner. Um, so really, I mean, when you're looking at these strategic transactions, though, the end game is to get those enrollment numbers up um, to improve your efficiency and reduce um, those operational costs, um, you know, and uh, to continue that educational legacy and mission. Um, and first and foremost, I know everybody today on this call and on this webinar wants to serve the students and protect the faculty. I mean, that's why um, we are all here. That's why Aaron, Sean, and I love working in this space because we serve the students and the faculty, um, and we want to make sure to, you know, protect that constituency and demographic. Um, you know, the other related part here, which Aaron will talk about a little bit later, and there's probably 18 webinars about this, but a highly regulated space, so you will want to, you know, engage advisors to walk you through the process. If you don't already have compliance on your team, um, you will want folks who work regularly in the space to assist you with, you know, this is not a, you know, a small deal. This is a pretty substantial um, change of control for most institutions, and so it'll it'll take some work. All right, so here in this section, um, you know, and I want to reiterate that today's webinar is only 60 minutes long, so we just have time today to talk about corporate and tax considerations. Um, the process is, you know, substantial. It's, it's complicated and it's not easy. You know, in addition to the legal side of getting the corporate structure right and making sure that you've done some tax planning up front, uh, you know, putting two institutions together is, uh, you know, a bit of work. You've got, you know, students, you've got faculty, operations, financial aid, endowments. Um, all of this can get pretty tricky. Um, and so today we're going to focus on the legal aspects that everyone should know about um, as they go through this process. So I mentioned that, you know, asset deals are a very common way um, to do it, a higher ed quote unquote merger. And so in an asset transaction, the parties get to negotiate selected assets and liabilities that will transfer over to a new buyer. And for purposes of this presentation, I'll just use seller and buyer generically, um, even though they could be, you know, we'll, we'll just keep the nomenclature simple. Um, and so I think of it as a line item kind of thing where I get to select the things that I want and then I get to buy those things. The selling legal entity remains in existence and may hold excluded assets or continue on. Maybe you're just getting the online program or four graduate divisions. So the, the selling entity would continue to hold on to its undergrad or other programs and continue to operate those. Um, this is really great for buyers. They love it because they get to cherry pick. Um, they get to purchase the things that they want. They don't have to you know, buy programs that might be duplicates of what they already have, so they have to, you know, pay for something that they already have. Um, you know, buyers also love finding new fields, whether it's, you know, cannabis or cryptocurrency, and they can immediately tack on those offerings to their existing student um, body. So I've also been asked in asset transactions, where does the money go? So I will just very quickly say that, you know, in an asset deal, the buyer purchases certain assets that are listed somewhere from a seller. 
So that money, whatever the payment is, the consideration goes to the selling entity that you know remains after closing. In a for-profit situation, that those proceeds may then be distributed to the owners of the selling entity. And Sean will talk a little bit later about the tax consequences of an asset distribution. And in nonprofits, um, that money will stay with the selling entity, but must be used for their you know, per permitted purpose, which, you know, for 501c3s has to relate to their mission. So in nonprofits, you know, nobody can profit, but it must be used to further the education and to help the institution. Hey, and Emily, can I, let me just jump in and say, some folks may be wondering, you know, how can you break apart an institution and just buy some of its programs or, you know, some of, how do you, do you just take the volleyball team and not the football team? And I, to be clear, while you might structure a transaction as an asset transaction, typically when you're combining institutions, um, what you're going to see is the acquiring entity or the buyer acquiring substantially all of the assets that constitute the school. Um, so, you know, you would anticipate that most of the programs, the locations, the uh, certainly, you know, students, faculty, staff, those types of things would all come over and be part of the new entity. Um, if you wanted the, the, the school that you're buying to be a division of your institution, you could, you could look at it that way. You could also uh, try to preserve that institution and hold it out to the public essentially as still being an independent institution, even though it would be under the umbrella of the larger buying uh, school. But, but I want to be clear, I, you, it's, it's less common in our experience that you would have a situation where someone would only be buying a part of what we sort of from the public standpoint would view a part of the school. Now, what is more common, and Emily, I know you can speak to this, is that an acquiring institution might leave behind certain liabilities, um, uh, certain, uh, you know, per particular, uh, you know, if they own certain property that they didn't want and they wanted to leave with the selling institution or there were some programs that were almost taught out or something like that and they would be taught out before the transaction occurred. So there could be things like that, uh, legal concepts, liabilities and things along those lines that would be left behind. Um, but it is less common that you know, you'd have a buyer acquire only part of a school and my expectation is that would be uh, difficult for the regulators to understand as well. Typically their expectation is you know you're sort of acquiring most of the entity if not all of the entity as we think of it um, from the sort of public standpoint. So I'll leave it you at know, that. Aaron, yeah Aaron that is a terrific point. Um, I fully agree with that and that's absolutely fair. Um, so when you, and I'll kind of um, draw the distinction when we go to the equity transactions on the next slide. Um, but, for, you know, in an asset deal, whether it's selected assets and liabilities or substantially all of the assets and liabilities, maybe you don't take um, a piece of real estate or a program that would be duplicative to what you currently have. Um, that's um, certainly well understood by the regulators. And um, the difference legally is that, you know, buyer let's say I bought Aaron's assets, they would become Emily's assets. Whereas, you know, on the next slide, and I'll go there now, on an, in an equity transaction, a buyer would purchase the stock or the membership interests of the, the legal entity running the school. So that means that I would, you know, purchase the equity of the school. And so there's no name change, if you will. So that's really the, the main difference is that in the asset deal, you're picking and choosing the pencils and desks that you want, and they're going to be assigned over um, to buyer. Whereas in an equity transaction, and I have this kind of further down in the bullets, it's actually sometimes third parties are a little bit more comfortable with this because the name on contracts and things is not changing. It's just the ownership of the legal, legal entity owning the school is changing. Um, so you'll see here a few other things about equity. So think of equity as you're buying the whole thing, um, warts, liabilities, and all. You're just stepping into the shoes of that school. Um, sellers love this, and Sean will talk about how um, you, you might be able to get capital gains treatment for those pro proceeds um, if you're a for-profit owner. Um, you know, I always say diligence is super critical in an equity deal because you're taking everything on. 
Um, typically, you assume all of the liabilities, so that's the good, the bad, and the ugly. So you really want to get in there and kick the tires and know what you're getting into. Um, and like I said, for those third parties, uh, whether it's your landlord or other folks, um, people who you have contracts with, um, you can let them know that there's been a change in the ownership, but that it will still be the same entity um, that they're used to dealing with and the name on the contracts um, won't really change. Um, so this slide sort of speaks to you know, for-profit schools. I want to just take a quick minute to talk about the nonprofit side. Um, nonprofits don't have equity, right? They don't have stock because they don't have owners. Um, nonprofits are typically run by a board. And so, you know, we've seen this structure in other industries like hospitals, for example. There are a lot of nonprofits. And so what typically happens on the equity side for nonprofits is we see an amendment of the governing docs, which would be, you know, could be the bylaws, could be the articles of incorporation, um, or, or even board resolutions that replace the board or replenish the board with a different set of trustees. Um, we could also amend those governing charter documents to install a sole member. And so the, the, and the member would then, that, the board of the new member would then run um, you know, the, the nonprofit institution. So it, whether it's a member substitution or a sponsorship agreement, you know, the equity side for nonprofits looks a little bit different. Um, but it's really pretty special to this space, and a lot of times I get some head scratching from folks who aren't used to the higher ed space and not understanding uh, what we're doing because it does look different from other industries and, and the for-profit side of things. All right, so here we'll let um, Sean talk a little bit about the tax considerations that you should think about as you consider tax, uh, as you consider asset, stock, and these various other structures we've been talking about. Uh, thank you, Emily. So at a high level, one of the first questions I sort of like to look at when analyzing a transaction is who are the parties? Now, if we're going to have two what I'll call tax-exempt entities entering into a transaction, a lot of the issues related to, quote-unquote, the tax world fall by the wayside, given that you're dealing with typically two 501c3s. But where it gets a little bit more complicated is when you introduce for-profit entities. Now, if you have a tax-exempt entity that is dealing directly with a for-profit entity, um, the tax-exempt entity has got to worry about different what I'll call doctrines that have been imposed by the IRS with respect to their 501c3 status. Those are private endearment, private benefit, and excess benefit. Now, the reason these matter is because if you have a private endearment or private benefit transaction, the IRS can revoke 501c3 status. And you may be asking, well, how is that, how is that going to apply in this context? It can apply where maybe you have a discounted purchase price, if you have a nonprofit who's selling their assets to a for-profit at an extreme discount, you might be asking, or IRS might ask, you know, essentially you're providing a private benefit or a private endearment to a, a for-profit entity, that which could result in the, you know, the seller losing his tax exempt status and ultimately having to pay tax on a sale that you, you know, didn't think it had to. Um, somewhat related to the private endearment you know, doctrine is excess benefit doctrine. The IRS sort of instituted this doctrine because they were getting sick and tired of having to revoke uh, entities 501c3 status or what they, what they considered sort of minor footfalls. And so the excess benefit transaction essentially allows the IRS to rather than revoke a 501c3 status to impose an excise tax. Now this excise tax is not imposed directly on the entity. Rather, it's going to be imposed on potentially the directors slash managers of the nonprofit, as well as a disqualified individual. So when you're looking at a transaction, you're thinking, hey, I'm a 501c3, I'm tax exempt, I have nothing to worry about. Sort of keeping it back in your mind, these three principles, to sort of check off with your advisors and make sure you're not running afoul of any rules. Now, where it gets exciting on my end as a tax advisor is when we get into dealing with you know, two for-profit entities who are taxable, who can benefit from a variety of different uh, structures. 
some of those things that you have to worry about if you're a buyer or sellers are basis step up, you know, character of the gain or loss, and your post acquisition structure. Now when I say basis step up, what I'm essentially talking about here is a increase in your cost basis of your underlying assets. Um, the IRS allows taxpayers to depreciate various assets they acquire over their useful lives. So for example, if I'm a school and I acquire a gymnasium, that gymnasium can be depreciated over a period of time that creates depreciation deductions, which will then lower my taxable income. So if you're a buyer looking at a transaction and you're trying to decide between asset deal and a stock deal, an asset deal is typically going to provide a basis to up up while a stock or equity deal won't. Um, there's a little caveat on that that I'll sort of speak about here shortly where you have equity deals that are treated as asset deals and it gets a little bit confusing, but we'll go through it in a slow manner to sort of make sure everybody is on the same page. Um, the character of the gain or loss, obviously there's different tax rates for ordinary income versus capital gains. So if you have someone or have a transaction where a seller is potentially going to be getting ordinary income versus capital gain, they ultimately could impact their bottom line. So that's an issue you want to pay attention to. And then obviously in the post acquisition structure, you want to make sure you're set up efficiently so that on a going forward basis, you're not overpaying tax. Now we don't necessarily say, you know, the whole goal on a post acquisition structure is to make sure you're paying the correct taxes, I'll say. Um, we don't want people paying or not paying their taxes, but we do want them to pay their correct tax. And if there's a way to minimize that taxation that's going to be owed, making sure you have an efficient post-acquisition structure, we're going to try to accomplish that. So as you'll see in the next slide, um, we're going to go through sort of high level some various issues between asset versus equity transactions. And the first one you'll notice on here is purchase price. And you might be asking, well, why would the purchase price be different for an equity or an asset deal if ultimately they're acquiring the same thing? And this kind of goes towards my point regarding a basis step up. A basis step up allows a buyer to, as I said, reduce his taxable income on a going forward basis. So if you're a buyer and you're obviously you're incentivized to reduce your taxable income going forward, you may be willing to pay more to do an asset deal than you would do an equity deal because of that basis step up you're going to get a benefit of. For example, if you're a C corporation and you're buying the assets of another C corporation, and let's say your purchase price was $10 million, assuming you have a basis of zero in the seller's assets, the buyer's going to get a $10 million basis in those assets going forward that could potentially provide roughly a $2 million benefit the buyer's going to get a $2 million benefit, it might be willing to pay more than slightly $10 million to the sellers to do an asset deal versus a stock deal. Um, another issue to kind of think about is the character of the game. You know, as we talked about, you know, asset transactions, when you're selling an asset, whether or not that's going to generate ordinary or capital gains is going to depend upon which asset is being sold. Now, when you sell assets, there's obviously different types. There's you know accounts receivable, there's inventory, there's prepaid expenses, there's real estate, there's equipment, there's goodwill. And each of those assets have a different sort of character. Now, when you're trying to figure out you know what exactly is going to be my bottom line, obviously you're going to be paying attention to your ultimate tax bill. So you're going to want to make sure that an asset deal if you're going to be having you know, a portion of the purchase price allocated to ordinary income assets, you're going to want to know what that impact is on you. Now, if you compare that to an equity deal, typically in an equity deal, if you sell stock or you sell equity, subject to a few exceptions, that's always going to result in capital gain. Now, you might, as a seller, generating capital gains is usually going to be better because, better because capital gains are taxed at a lower capital gains rate of roughly you know, 238 or 20 percent, depending upon whether or not you're subject to the net investment tax. So as a seller, when you're considering a transaction between an asset deal and an equity deal, obviously you want to pay attention to, well, what's my character going to be? Am I going to be paying tax at a higher order income rate versus the lower uh, capital gain rate? And sort of tie this in to the purchase price is that when you do an asset deal, that purchase price needs to be allocated 
amongst the various assets. So that purchase price, in my example, when you pay $10 million for you know a company's assets, that $10 million might be allocated partially to you know students receivables that are due, or the gymnasium that the you know school uses for its basketball or volleyball or you know different activities, or it might be allocated to the goodwill of the company of the school. You know, does the name mean something? Um, so obviously you're allocating that purchase price and asset deal. From a seller standpoint, you want to allocate more of that purchase price to capital gain assets. And from a buyer standpoint, you want to allocate that purchase price to more of assets that are going to provide a immediate benefit. For example, uh, receivables or inventory or potentially bonus depreciation assets under the new tax reform. So when you're going through a transaction, you know, the purchase price, the character, and the allocation are obviously very important to make sure you can get to the correct result or the right result, whether or not you're a seller or a buyer. Uh, in stock acquisitions, allocation of the purchase price doesn't really matter because the entire purchase price is going to be allocated to the stock of the school. Now you'll see a note here about double versus single taxation. And you might be thinking, well, single taxation sounds a lot better than double taxation, and you're right. Um, typically, people prefer single layers of taxation. In a stock deal, that's when you're going to get your single layer of taxation. If someone sells a piece of stock, they're going to pay tax at that level, and that's it. Assuming that it's owned by you know one tax one eighty nine a chain. Now, if you compare that to an asset deal, when a corporation, for example, sells assets, the corporation will pay tax at the corporate level rates. And when that corporation distributes the cash out from the sale, the shareholders of the corporation will also pay tax. So that's why we call it double taxation, because one transaction essentially resulted in two layers of tax. Now, the U.S. corporate rate is 21%. Um, the individual rate on dividends is roughly 20%. So in a single transaction, your tax rate is essentially 41, 42%, depending upon you know, various factors. So it's something to sort of keep in mind that when we're talking about comparing asset deals versus stock deals, that you need to take into account getting the cash out of you know the for-profit company. Um, it's great that the company is only going to pay one layer of tax, but when it distributes the cash out to the shareholders, they're also going to pay a tax. The so one dollar can quickly turn into sixty cents. Um, moving on to the next slide, I wanted to quickly kind of talk about what I'll call equity deals that are really asset deals for tax purposes. Now, an equity deal in this context and in Emily's world is going to be buying the equity or selling the equity. You're going to be selling the equity of a corporation, selling the equity of an LLC. Um, and those are easier to do from a corporate perspective from what Emily tells me. But just because you're doing an equity deal from a corporate perspective does not mean you're doing an equity deal from a tax perspective. Now, there's an entity out there called the Disregard Entity, which is essentially an LLC that's owned by one person. The IRS has come out and said that when an LLC owned by one person sells, that they're going to treat that as an asset sale. They're going to treat that as if that individual or that owner sold an undivided interest in each of the assets of the school. So, you know, let's say a school has a C-Corp parent and underneath it has different um, parts of the school broken up in LLCs for a variety of reasons. If we're to sell off one of those LLCs, even though that's an equity deal from Emily's perspective and Emily's world and most people's perspectives, it's actually treated as an asset deal from a tax perspective. And the only reason that I reference this or mention this is I want to make sure people are aware that just because someone tells you they're doing an equity deal doesn't mean it's truly an equity deal from a tax perspective. So you want to keep this in mind if you're both a buyer and a seller. A seller, obviously, because it could impact your character of the gain and what your ultimate tax bill is and buyer as well because it's an easy way to get a basis step up without actually having to acquire each of the assets. Um, next you'll see on this list is a partnership. Now I use partnership in a tax sense. This could be an LLC that's also taxed as a partnership. 
Um, and something to keep in mind is that when a partnership sells or someone acquires a 100% interest in a partnership, that is going to be treated differently from the seller's perspective as well as a buyer's perspective. Um, from buyer's perspective, it's going to be treated as truly as an acquisition of the underlying assets. From seller's perspective, it's going to be treated as a sale of equity. So it kind of creates this weird you know, situation where seller's tax treatment is actually different than buyer's tax treatment. Um, now, you may have seen in the earlier slide when I was talking about character gain, saying generally when you sell equity, that that's going to be a capital gain subject to a few exceptions. This is one of those exceptions. When a seller will, you know, sell, you know, partnership equity, what the rules say is that the general characterization of that is going to be capital gain. But they have an exception for what we call hot assets. And these aren't good hot assets. These are, these are bad hot assets. And those hot assets are essentially accounts receivable, depreciation, recapture, and inventory. And what that means is that the portion of the purchase price attributable to those assets will actually result in ordinary income treatment to the sellers. So it's one of those weird situations where you actually have a sale of equity that will result or could result, excuse me, in ordinary income treatment. And then the last uh, bullet on this list is corporations. Now, when a buyer acquires a corporation, the general rule is gonna be that that's treated as a stock deal. Uh, but the IRS provides an exception to that sort of general treatment, what we call a 338H10 election, or it could be a 338G election. But what essentially that means is you're going to turn a stock deal into an asset deal by filing a form with the IRS that says that both parties agree that we're going to treat this as an asset deal from a tax perspective. Now, there's various requirements with respect to 338H10s. One of them is you got to acquire more than 80% of the stock. Um, two, it's probably only going to be beneficial with respect to S corporations unless you have a C corporation with a potentially high net operating loss. It could use offset, um, you know, potential gain at the company level. Because you're going to recall that when we were talking about corporations and the corporations doing asset sales, there's that two layers of taxation. Well, if you do an H10 with this or 330G election with a C corporation. What that essentially means is that the corporation is going to be treated as selling its assets in exchange for cash and then distributing the cash out to its shareholders. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense if or unless that C corporation has some sort of net operating loss that it can use or shield some of the gain from that deemed asset sale. But it creates, like I said, this world where we're doing, for all intents and purposes, an equity deal from a corporate perspective, um, but from a tax perspective, it's actually an asset deal. And then the last point on here is forward merger. Um, I threw that in there as sort of an uh, indication that just because you're doing a, you know, what might look like a stock deal again from a non-tax perspective, you know, if it's a situation where the target school is going to be merging with and into the choir, that'll actually be treated or could be treated as an asset deal from a tax perspective. So it actually could create a situation where maybe sellers are surprised by their tax liability when they thought this was an equity deal and they thought they were getting capital gain treatment, where it turns out to be an asset deal and they're actually getting, you know, ordinary income treatment or potentially double taxation. So, you know, the, the big picture of sort of this slide is to make sure that when you're going through the process of starting to looking at acquiring or selling that you speak with your advisors to figure out a structure that's going to achieve the result you want to accomplish. If you're a buyer, you're going to want to look at a structure where potentially you could do an equity deal that's treated as an asset deal to provide you with the basis step up. Or if you're a seller, you want to make sure that whatever structure is being proposed to you is actually going to result in you paying the least amount of taxes as you know, possible in these situations. So it's always good to sort of run this by a tax person prior to entering into an LOI where you agree to a structure or sort of thinking about, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, the bottom line dollars are going to be taken home because obviously taxes are going to impact that. Uh, Emily, that's it for me. I think we have some bonus content. Yeah, thank you so much, Sean. And I think that's really great advice because I, I have in my notes here, results may vary. 
So it'll be very fact specific, right? Depending on what side of the table you're sitting on. Um, if you're a for-profit, non-profit, um, what your business goals are. And I, I think it's interesting. And by the way, I would not try to complete any corporate transaction without tax advice. So Sean and I work very closely on everything that I do, and I recommend that for everyone on the line today. Um, but I, did, I found it amusing, and maybe I was just the nerd in me, that you know, for regulatory, Department of Ed, or general public purposes, something could be called a merger. For corporate purposes, it could be considered an equity deal, and for tax purposes, it could be called an asset transaction. So hopefully that doesn't confuse everyone, but I, I got a kick out of that. And so I think since we have this very interested group on the line, I thought I would throw in some bonus content here. Um, we've got Erin Lacey for a few more minutes. Um, so I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about, in addition to corporate and tax, um, some of the regulatory considerations. And of course, you know, that's, you know, 400 more webinars. Um, but we can talk a little bit maybe today about the, uh, you know, about the Department of Ed and just a couple of things that folks need to have on their radars as they consider a transaction for their school. Yeah, sure. And I, I just want to echo something um, Sean said at the end here. I, I don't think the purpose of this webinar for the folks on the line is to master all of the ideas we're throwing around. Uh, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, if you want to go back and listen to it on demand and parse through, uh, you know, Sean's explanations on the tax side, which I find hard to follow, and I do a lot of this kind of work, but I'm not a tax attorney, uh, you can do that. But uh, my suggestion here is that the real lesson, and it is the one uh, and frankly, if there's any one thing you're going to take away from this, this is what I suggest it should be. And it's the point Sean just made, which is this stuff is complicated. And there are lots of layers of consideration. I mean, Emily noted we're not even talking about academic and operational integrations, which sometimes are so complex and overwhelming that institutions will abandon transactions without regard to the financial or regulatory or tax considerations. But assuming you think you can get through those and it's a good cultural and academic and operational fit to, to merge together or to come up with some other sort of partnership or transaction, you know, the legal and the regulatory and the tax considerations also are considerable. It's complicated. And, and here's the best advice I can get you. You want to engage knowledgeable professionals, whether that's us or anybody else, but you want to engage knowledgeable professionals very early on so that you can sit down with a tax person and an M&A person and a, you know, a regulatory person who knows the department and all these other regulatory things around higher education specifically, and maybe your accountant and your business folks at your school, and talk about what makes sense. What are our objectives, to Emily's point? Who do we think a likely buyer or merger partner is going to be? Um, you know, are we a nonprofit, and are we looking at a, a, a platform owned by a for-profit entity? Or, you know, all of those things, at the very outset, you want to try to take into consideration. And Emily made the point earlier on, and I'll hit this again too, and you want to do it sooner rather than later. I will tell you one of the unfortunate uh, experiences I have had in the last five years or so as there have been more distressed institutions looking for partners is that, and Emily said this, they wait too late, right? And it's hard. If you're a geographically isolated private nonprofit that's been around 90 years in the middle of a Midwestern state and your board is largely comprised of alumni who love the school, the idea of surrendering that institution or merging into another you know, larger institution can be very hard to deal with. And, and we understand that. But if you wait too late, it may no longer be an option. At least engage some professionals and talk about what your options might be and what an optimal type of transaction would be and look like early on so that you, you understand what the path would be going forward and what the timetable would likely be that would be required. So so let this stuff wash over you, but the primary lesson is, you know, it's complicated and there are a lot of different ways you can do it and depending on your objectives and the nature of your institution, there's probably a structure out there that's better for you than some of the others we've been talking about and you want to figure out what that is and you want to figure it out 
early on. Um, you know, we did a webinar I mentioned two months ago where I went, and it's on our website. It's free. You can go listen to it right now if you wanted to, all about the Department of Education's change of ownership process. So I don't want to go through that. It's been changing a little bit in recent months and in some significant ways. Uh, I encourage you to go back and check out that webinar if it's something you're interested in or if you're currently entertaining a transaction. But the main point I'll just make here is there are some fairly significant regulatory considerations, particularly if you participate in the federal financial aid programs, which most institutions on the line probably do. Um, and you are going to want to not only think about sort of the corporate structural questions Emily's addressed and the tax issues that Sean has raised, but you're also going to want to consider um, how do we go about whatever this transaction is that we're considering, will it be deemed a change of ownership or control by our regulatory entities, meaning the department and your creditor, if you're authorized by a state, that state. If you're in a lot of different states or you have programmatic accreditors uh, or you operate internationally, you may have other regulators outside of the primary sort of triad of higher education, your home state, your creditor, institutional accreditor in the Department of Ed. Uh, you may have other regulators you have to deal with. They may not all consider it a change of ownership or control because they all have different standards. Um, some of them might uh, or, or they may all get there. But you need to figure out what their processes are going to be uh, and how long it's going to take to get through those processes successfully. Because in most cases, if you don't successfully get through a process with one of your regulators, you will cease to be approved. Um, how you structure a, a relationship with another institution, whether, you know, to Emily's point, it's a merger or an acquisition or what have you, um, can impact whether these different regulators would consider it a change of ownership or control. And in some cases, you may have opportunity uh, while keeping in, in good graces with your corporate and tax advisors to structure a transaction in a way that will make it easier for your regulators to digest, meaning the, you know, the Department of Ed and your educational regulators. And you might want to take advantage of that. So I, I'll leave it at that because I want to make sure we have some time here for questions. But the important point is you've got at least three levels uh, of regulatory and sort of legal consideration that go into these transactions. And I just can't stress enough, get good people on your team and get them early and think through what makes sense for your organization. So, Aaron, I, I, you know, I, I just put these additional bonus um, points on here, but I agree with you. These are just um, I, I think of them as, you know, considerations that are particular and special to higher ed. Um, you know, you want, to your point, your very good point, you want advisors, you know, who work in this space regularly. The higher ed bar is pretty small. Um, we all know one, one another pretty well. Um, same goes for accountants. Um, there are accountants who understand how financial aid works and student receivables and all that kind of good stuff. Um, I will just say that when I do deals with just pure corporate attorneys who have not worked in this regulated space, it is so painful to explain to these folks, you know, what a composite score is or, you know, um, all of these things that why do we have to close in the first 10 calendar days of a month? I mean, you know, it's not, I don't mean it in a pejorative way, but it's just so much more, we would much rather engage with um, folks who are in the space and understand the needs of the institutions and how this is beneficial to everyone. So I think that's a great segue um, to these. We tried to boil down our takeaways um, for these to these points. Um, Aaron, uh, Sean, you want to take that first one? Sure. Um... You know, kind of, the, you know, the overall point I echoed before is that, you know, where you're at the LOI phase or someone comes to you and says, we're going to be doing a transaction, whether or not you're the buyer or the seller, that's the best time to do tax planning. Um, coming to, you know, a tax advisor, you know, after an LOI is signed, um, after the structure has been agreed to, and trying to put, you know, what I'll call the, you know, the party back in the bag is very difficult. Um, so that, you know, Overall message is that you know don't try to do this alone. We have there's qualified advisors out there. Myself, Aaron, Emily are happy to kind of talk to you about it beforehand, um, and sort of try to address as many issues you can as early on in the process as possible. I think that's a great one, and you know many clients bring us 
signed term sheets or letters of intent, and it does get difficult to back out of them, and you know the other party may be upset that you're trying to change things, and so it's much easier um, to bake in some advice up front um, so that it's, I just think it's very, it's money very well spent um, and really could either improve the valuation of your institution, um, you know, through the ways that Sean talked about, including, you know, maybe you could actually get more um, depending on the corporate structure, or, you know, we can think of a creative way to, um, you know, do some efficient tax planning so that it's not inefficient or, you know, you don't have to pay two levels of tax and, you know, let's try to be thoughtful about it up front. Um, so I, I did sort of belabor this point a little bit earlier, um, but it is really critical um, to work with advisors in the space, um, particularly um, the regulatory side, I think, is so specialized. Um, and if folks, um, you know, you don't want to be reinventing the wheel here. You want folks who can hit the ground running, know exactly when to approach those accreditors, attorneys general, Department of Ed. You've got, you know, specific windows of time here, um, and you want to hit those windows. If you don't, you know, go through the process properly, um, it could delay things or completely, you know, obliviate or, you know, destroy the process. Um, and, you know, a lot of times we see institutions out of time. And so you kind of have one shot to get those approvals in at the right time. So it's really critical to find folks who can support you. Now, with respect to the third bullet point, connecting your legal team with your accountants, your accountants are probably the ones who are going to have the most information regarding the financial status of the school. Um, and when we're trying to analyze different tax structures, it's going to be very fact-specific. And so this is going to be a situation where we're probably going to have to touch base with your accountants, figure out your exact fact pattern, um, Figure out, you know, for example, do you have any losses that could offset gain from an asset sale? Um, you know, if you're a buyer, are you projecting losses in the future? Do you really benefit from a basis step up, or is it not worth it because you have losses from previous transactions or previous years that you're going to utilize on a going forward basis? And it's also always good to kind of connect your accounting team with your legal team up front is that making sure you're on the same page regarding the tax treatment or tax structure so that there are no surprises come April 15th or October 15th when tax returns are being filed where you know maybe the accountant thinks one thing prepares the tax return that way and it turns out the you know, tax return was supposed to be prepared a different way because we structured this as an asset deal not a stock deal and the accountant wasn't aware of that. So it's always good to sort of keep everybody in the loop just in case there's some facts or some information that can be shared that could be proved beneficial in the process. And on this um, this fourth point here, and I apologize if we're belaboring this too much, but the, the clock management really is super critical. Um, so to the owners, the presidents, and the leaders of institutions on the line, um, the tendency that we see is to hesitate, is to be reluctant, to consider M&A as a potential option for your institution. Um, I would say that, you know, consider it always as a, you know, a possibility for the, your vision for the institution's future. Um, really plan ahead and give yourself plenty of time. If it feels too early or a little bit, you know, if, if it feels like it's prescient or, you know, just not quite right yet, that's probably the right time to just have some informal conversations, whether it's with the board or, you know, maybe with some other presidents that you trust and with, could have a confidential um, discussion with. Um, if you think you're too early, that's probably the right time is what we've seen in our practice. Erin, you want to talk a little bit about the regulatory runway? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. I and I'll I, I want to get us onto the end here, but um, I, you know, you probably need if you're uh, the Department of Education. One thing I talked a lot about last week or uh, a couple months ago, rather, when we did the the webinar specific to the department's process. I mean, they are um, working very hard right now, but the uptick in transactions across all sectors and sort of the creativity and complexity of those transactions uh, has uh, has put a significant burden on them. And all of this is just to say what it, it, once upon a time it took 60, 30 days out from when you are rather 60 to 90 days out from when you plan to consummate a transaction, you know, to, to start working with the department. Now you should probably budget six months. Um, and, and if you are working with the Washington, D.C. element of uh, federal student aid, you may need six to nine months um, to get everything you need uh, from the U.S. Department of Education or that a buyer typically would want uh, to see from the department before consummating a transaction. Similarly, if you're dealing with uh, a regional accreditor, you should probably start talking with them and planning to submit required approvals six months out at least from when you anticipate uh, consummating the transaction. Um, and there are a number of other regulators you may have to deal with, but most of those typically are, you can, uh, programmatic accreditors, I mean other state entities, you can probably complete their processes in less, to six month, less than six months. But all of this is to say, you know, if you're an institution of higher education uh, these days and you're planning on going through an institution level substantive change or transaction, I think you're going to need to be uh, applying to regulators and uh, having very meaningful conversations with them at least six months out from when you intend to consummate the transaction. And if you're, you know, if you are an institution looking to potentially combine with or merge with a distressed entity, or if you are the distressed institution and you're looking for a partner, um, understand that, you know, as your resources dwindle and the distress becomes uh, more intense, you know, it just gets all the more difficult to work through these processes with the regulators or potentially satisfy all their concerns and get approval for a transaction. And so again, you know, planning in advance, allowing time uh, is really critical. And I think, Emily, that takes us to TC Resources. Should I just jump on through that quickly? Absolutely. Yep. I know we're out of time here. so. Yeah, yeah. So just for the folks still on the line, we have the webinars on demand. Um, the These uh, slides, I believe the links are embedded in the slides, uh, but it's very easy to find on our website. And if for some reason you can't find these, um, by all means, just reach out to one of us and we can give you the link. We also have our blog, Regucation, where we write about higher education issues, including some of the ones we discuss, and our webinars. So very happy for you to sign up and follow our blog. Um, and we periodically put out resources for the higher education community. Uh, either as part of blog posts or in connection with webinars. For example, we had our reporting guide uh, under the bar defense rule that sort of laid out in a nice chart what institutions needed to be reporting to the U.S. Department of Education. And occasionally we'll do model letters and things of that nature as well. So sign up for the blog, follow the webinars, uh, and it, keep an eye out for those kinds of materials. That can be helpful. Uh, there you see nice uh, photos of Emily and Sean looking very professional. That's me doing my uh, lumberjack professor impression. Uh, and with that, uh, I guess we'll see if uh, we have any questions. I wasn't sure. It looked like uh, folks were really just allowing this stuff to sort of uh, wash over and absorb. So I'm not sure we actually have any cues today. Um, but if you do have questions, I'll just suggest uh, that we would be happy to field them. Uh, so you can reach out to Emily or Sean, depending on the nature of the inquiry, or me, and we certainly uh, can, can chat and see if there's anything else we can help you out with. Um, otherwise, please keep in mind we do have another webinar scheduled for late November as part of this series uh, that's going to be on the new rules we expect to come from the Department of Education here in late October and very early November. Otherwise, we hope everyone is enjoying fall on campus or wherever you might be, uh, and uh, we'll speak again soon. Bye.